German Chancellor Olaf Scholz condemned the war in Ukraine in a phone call Friday with Russian President Vladimir Putin, the German government said, in the first such conversation in two years. Government spokesman Stefan Hebestreit said Scholz condemned Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine during the call, and called on Putin to end it by withdrawing troops that invaded the country in February 2022. The Chancellor urged Russia to be willing to negotiate with Ukraine with the aim of achieving a just and lasting peace and stressed Germany's unwavering determination to support Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression for as long as necessary, Hebestreit said in a statement. Scholz had spoken beforehand with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, and would do so again after the call with Putin, the statement said. The German leader condemned Russian air raids on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure and warned that the deployment of North Korean troops to Russia to fight in the war against Ukraine would mark a serious escalation of the conflict. The United States, South Korea and Ukraine say North Korea has sent thousands of troops to Russia to support its war against Ukraine. The German government statement did not say how long the call with Putin lasted, but German news agency DPA said it was about one hour. The Russian government did not immediately have any comment about the call. The call comes as the conflict nears next Tuesday's 1,000-day mark since the February 24, 2022 invasion by Russian troops. NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte visited a battlegroup exercise called Resolute Warrior in Latvia on Thursday. Ruta was there to promote European defense spending and production of military supplies. Ruta said that 2% defense spending by NATO allies is insufficient. It is simply not enough, he stressed, urging members of the Transatlantic Alliance to spend more during a joint press conference with Latvia President Edgars Rinkiewicz. Currently, some 3,500 Allied troops are training at Adatsi military base in Latvia as part of Resolute Warrior. In my view, there will be a couple of big issues we need to debate over the coming months. Of course, first of all, we have to make sure that Ukraine prevails and that Putin will not win in Ukraine. That is absolute priority number one. But behind that, there are two other big issues at stake. One is that 2%, when you take out the U.S. spending, we are now at 2% in Europe as NATO. It is simply not enough, as the President just was saying. It is simply not enough. So we will need to have the debate on spending more. And another big issue is defense production. We are not producing enough at this moment. We have to do more to replenish our stockpiles, uh, to make sure that we are ready to face off any adversary. So these two issues, defense spending and defense production, and all of this working with our partners, the EU, but also in the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, the southern neighborhood, this is crucial. The, the United States is an integral part of NATO. They have founded the alliance. They are not into NATO because of some historical reason that they didn't want to repeat the mistake after the First World War, uh, not to repeat the mistake after the Second World War. They know that this is an integral part of their defense, of our defense, our collective defense. And sometimes we talk about frontline states. Let me make absolutely clear, the Netherlands and France and the United Kingdom are frontline states. Uh, we are there together with the Baltics, Poland, all the other member states of NATO. We are all frontline states. There is not uh, a, a frontline state which is closer to Russia or farther away from Russia. And we need the US, and the US needs us, we need each other to work on this. It was Trump who, from 2016 onwards, was pushing us on this part of NATO to spend more on defense. Look what's happening on Latvia, moving up to north of 3.5 percent uh, overall eu nato now at two percent and we need to do more we need to ramp up industry production so on all of this we need the us the us needs us we are together in nato all for one one for one. the ukrainian defense forces operation in the kursk region has been ongoing for 100 days during this time the enemy has shelled its own territory 11,578 times citing the operational command north 
According to the Ukrainian armed forces, by leveling their own settlements and killing their own citizens, the Russians have dropped 3,243 guided aerial bombs and 356 unguided aerial rockets on their own land. In addition, over the past 100 days, the Russians have dropped 2,462 explosive devices from drones and used 2,175 FPV drones. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces have burned dozens of armored vehicles and destroyed hundreds of enemies on the Kursk front. The defense forces began the operation in the Kursk region at the beginning of August. Ukrainian troops took control of dozens of settlements and created a buffer zone in the border areas of the Russian Federation. The Russian army conducted a series of offensive actions to retake the territory. The Russian army has also engaged North Korean soldiers in battles in the Kursk region. According to the NYT, Russia has gathered 50,000 troops in the Kursk region, including North Korean soldiers, for an offensive. As President Volodymyr Zelensky explained, the Kursk operation was a preemptive move as there was information that the Russians were preparing an offensive on the Sumy region. Moscow's bombings on its own territory have seemingly intensified, with accidental bombs that have fallen on Russia and the occupied territories of Ukraine exacerbated by intentional attacks on Kyiv troops in Kursk. The Kremlin has previously admitted that its aircraft have mistakenly bombed territory under Russian control, with many of these instances taking place in the Belgorod region, which shared a border with Ukraine in the west of Russia. Between March and October, a total of 130 Soviet FAB aerial bombs have accidentally fallen on Russian land or occupied territory, according to calculations by Astra, a Russia-Ukraine war reporting telegram channel. But on top of this, Russia has fired glide bombs at Ukrainian troops near the border of Russia's western Kursk region. Russia previously fitted their FABs with unified planning and gliding modules systems, which equip the bombs with wings and satellite guidance to enable the Russians to launch the bombs at Ukrainian targets directly from Russian territory. Bombs with an abnormal descent are not supposed to explode, left to be destroyed by explosive experts after the fact, but this is not always the case in reality. On May the 4th, during strikes on the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, a Russian plane dropped a FAB 500 on Belgorod, which ended up injuring seven people and damaging 31 houses. Russia had started deploying modified Soviet-era FAB 500s with an attached wing and navigation kit earlier in 2023 as an alternative to dwindling precision-guided missiles. Military expert Ruslan Leviev said that although the glide bombs retrofitted guidance systems are unreliable, only a fraction of these bombs fail, so it doesn't affect the practical effectiveness of this weapon, no matter how cynical that may sound.